Hey CW Bio, this is Mr. Kennedy and these are your notes on the cell membrane and cell transport. Remember all these videos are always available from our YouTube channel and handouts that go with them are on our class webpage. Let's dive in. So as we get started with the cell membrane and cell transport, one of the first things we have to revisit is why do we have these things, right? Um, living things from the cell all the way up to big things like us we have to maintain balance regardless of what's going on inside or outside of our bodies at all time. That doesn't mean you can't ever trip and fall over. That means that, take body temperature for example, you have to maintain a body temperature of 98.6 degrees all the time. I don't care if it's 110 outside or 32 degrees outside. You need to be 98.6 degrees. That's called maintaining balance or homeostasis. Your absolute survival depends on it. We all know what happens if your temperature gets too high and too or too cold. Um, cells work the same way. And it's more than just temperature. It's all the way down to molecules and ions and everything that's going in and out of the cell. Like it has to be kept at balance all the time. The survival of the cell depends on it. So how do we control what goes into and out of the cell? Well, we start with this thing, which you learned about in a previous video where I was talking about cell parts. This is your plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is the boundary that separates the cell from its environment. Um, it's what I described in that past video as the gatekeeper, the gatekeeper of the cell, basically deciding what can go in and what can go out. Bear in mind, the plasma membrane doesn't have a brain. So how does it decide what goes in and out? It's chemistry, chemistry, chemistry. Now. What's going in? What's going out? The plasma membrane's job is to allow a steady supply of life-giving mo molecules like glucose, amino acids, and lipids. These have to be constantly moved into the cell no matter what the external conditions are. It also has to remove anything that shows up in excess. So if you get too much glucose, too much amino acids, too many lipids, you get waste that builds up, or even just plain old water, like that stuff's got to be removed. Otherwise, the cell could literally explode. That's what maintaining homeostasis is all about. Maintaining balance, equilibrium, however you want to describe it, it's homeostasis. Because the cell is letting some things go in and not everything go in, we say what it's doing is showing selective permeability. This is that process of sorting, right, things out that can go in, some things are allowed in, and other things aren't. That's how we maintain homeostasis. How does it do it? Again, it's chemistry. Let's look at that. So your plasma membrane or your cell membrane is made up of a molecule called a phospholipid. Phospholipids have a phosphate head and a lipid tail, which is why they're called a phospholipid. And your cell membranes are made out of these molecules oriented back to back, just like you see here. Why do they sit back to back like that? Well, really it's pretty simple. Um, the top part of the molecule, this part, uh, really, really loves water. It's hydrophilic, so it's going to orient itself to face water. The legs or tails of the molecule hate water. They are hydrophobic. They're lipids. They want to get as far away from the water as possible. So they orient themselves towards other lipids. Out here where the word plasma membrane is, you would have water. Down here at this edge of the box, you would have water. In the middle here, you would have no water. That's why they orient themselves this way. So kind of as a rule, anything that is large or charged cannot pass through this membrane. Anything that's small or uncharged can pass through no problem. If you are hydrophilic, you are charged. Okay, so anything that is charged is gonna wanna stay out here, right? And the size thing should be self-explanatory. If I try to shove a massive molecule through the cell membrane, hey, at the end of the day, that's like shoving my fist through the side of a latex balloon. Um, the balloon's going to pop, right? So your cell membrane would explode. So big stuff and charged stuff doesn't want to pass through the membrane. Small stuff and stuff that's not charged, if you're not charged, you would actually be attracted to the center of the membrane and you could easily fit through, right? That stuff goes through no problem. Here's a couple of pictures just to kind of further illustrate the parts of the phospholipid. 
So here again, we have the phosphate head, the glycerol neck, and then the two fatty acid chains, the phosphate head, hydrophilic, charged, loves water. Glycerol is just the glue holding top and bottom together. Lipid tails, hydrophobic, not charged, hates water. That's how it works, okay? So moving on to the membrane itself in totality. So the membrane, as all of its working pieces come together, starts to look like this. You can see down here we've got double row of phospholipids, and then there's these beige things that are embedded in it, which we'll talk more about in a minute. So as all these pieces come together, they form kind of a fluid mosaic. It was once thought that your cell membrane was hard like an eggshell. After continued study, we learned that all these molecules, well, they can actually move around freely and somewhat at random. So they can spin around in circles, they can go left, they can go right, all that kind of stuff. The one thing that they virtually never do is where you'll get a phospholipid that's facing this way, flip and decide to go to the other side. Reason why they virtually never do that is because you'd have to take something that's positively charged, the phosphate head, and shove it through the center of the membrane, which is not charged. Not really likely to happen. So that's the idea in the flexible nature of your cell membrane. Now, how do we get it to stay flexible? Well, we need these things, these molecules called cholesterol in the membrane to help maintain the integrity of the membrane and to help keep it flexible. Cholesterol is all about uh, maintaining that integrity. It gets kind of a bad name from dietitians. You know, they say like, watch your cholesterol, right? It leads to heart disease. Well, that's true. But in this case, we actually need it uh, you need cholesterol in your cell membranes or they would firm up and nothing would go through them. Uh, speaking of stuff going through them, aside from the large and charged and small and uncharged thing, we also got to talk about these guys. Transport proteins. So in that picture I showed you a little while ago, there were those little tan um, embedded structures in the membrane. Uh, those are your transport proteins. They're needed to allow substances or waste to move through the membrane that is too big or carrying a charge and can't fit in between the phospholipids without doing damage. Uh, they come in all kinds of different types and sizes. Uh, we'll worry about that as we go through this in more detail later. Some of them are just like static open holes, and if that's the case, they're basically referred to as a you know protein channel. Others are pumps, so they like physically pump things. Some have caps to them, so they're called gated channels. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. But for lack of a better way to put it, they're all really doing the same thing, and that is moving stuff across the membrane that's too big or carrying a charge that can't get through any other way. Transport proteins. All right, that brings us to the different kinds of transport that are needed to keep a cell up and running and maintain homeostasis. So the first thing I'm going to point out is there are a number of terms here, diffusion, osmosis, passive transport, active transport, facilitated transport, endo and exocytosis. We will study these in lab, but, um, and we can also put a few of these together. Um, facilitated transport, diffusion and osmosis can actually all fit under the umbrella of passive transport. Active transport really is in of itself its own thing and you know includes endo and exocytosis. So let's kind of break these down. Diffusion. Diffusion, as I said, is passive transport of molecules into and out of a cell. And simply put, we're going to move molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. So if I got a lot of something over here and very little over here, that something is going to go that way. Okay, um, you could think of like putting a drop of dye in water, you know, diffusion, right? Air freshener, you spray it in the air and it spreads out to the room, diffusion. Molecules can diffuse through the air, through liquids, and they rely on the kinetic energy of the molecules around them to push them. They always go from high to low, and there's really nothing that can stop it unless there's a barrier like the cell membrane that gets in the way. Molecules will keep moving until they reach equilibrium. At equilibrium, the molecules will actually still move, but they're going to move in equal concentration. So if I have all my molecules balanced out in equilibrium and one goes this way, I'm going to get one to go that way to replace it. They're going to stay in balance. If they are unbalanced, 
that's what we call a concentration gradient. So again, if I have a bunch of molecules over here and a very little over here, that's an unequal distribution of molecules on either side of my face, like a semi-permeable barrier, and that's what a concentration gradient's all about. These molecules want, right, to go from one side to the other, from left to right, but there's a barrier in the way that prevents it, okay? So that's where we get concentration gradients. These gradients can be used to generate energy and to do work, so they aren't awful, um, but you do need to know what they are. Okay, now, diffusion across membranes. In order for molecules to move across the membrane, the membrane has to have some permeability. Well, fortunately for us, your cell membrane is actually selectively permeable, so some molecules can simply diffuse right on through. In the event that it's, again, large or charged, that's the one that's going to get the no-no from the cell membrane itself. So a couple definitions. If you're permeable, it allows molecules to pass all the way through it easily. If you're selectively permeable, remember, only allows certain things to pass through. Okay, so this is a different type of diffusion. Um, it's called osmosis. Uh, osmosis literally is the diffusion of water. So the net movement of water molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration is how we define osmosis, or basically the diffusion of water. Okay, so when water moves from high concentration to low concentration, it's called osmosis. Now, oftentimes there's membranes in the way that prevent water and other dissolved stuff from going where it wants to go. So there's some terms, osmotic environments, that you need to know. First one is hypotonic. If you have a hypotonic solution, you have less or lower dissolved substances, right, uh, or solutes uh, than a solution to which you're being compared or a cell. If we put that in plain English, that means I got my cell right here and the stuff that it's floating in has less dissolved stuff in it than what's in the cell itself. So water's gonna move from high concentration to low concentration. The water will go pouring into the cell. The cell could swell up and burst as water rushes in. That's no bueno for an animal cell. Hypertonic's the exact opposite. The solution has a higher concentration of dissolved stuff or solute than the solution to which it's being compared or a cell. So again, I got my cell here. It's floating around in a liquid. There's more stuff outside the cell than inside. That basically means there's less water. So water is going to, it's going to rush out of the cell. The cell will shrink, shrivel up. It'll look like a pruned up raisin, right? Um, also, no bueno for a cell. But one thing to remember, a cell that explodes in a hypotonic solution, it can't recover. You just got to make a new cell. If you have a cell shriveled up in a hypertonic solution, if you put water back on it, it could potentially swell back up and function. It just depends on how long it was shriveled. All right, last one is isotonic. Isotonic is where everything is equal, so you have equal concentrations of dissolved stuff, solutes, on both sides of the cell membrane. Now, I don't want you to think that nothing happens like in total, like nothing happens, but like molecules will still move. It's just they're going to move equally. One goes into the cell for every one that goes out of the cell, right? Homeostasis. Homeostasis, osmosis itself, super, super important, right? Osmosis is really important for both plants and animals. It can cause plasmolysis and cytolysis, which basically is where cells will, as I described, um, explode if they get too much water in them or shrivel up if they don't have enough. Okay, that brings us to some other kinds of transport. Carrier transport, facilitated transport, active transport, endoexocytosis. Now, when we use the word carrier transport, what we're really doing is kind of setting the stage for those other kinds of transport that I just mentioned. This is transport of molecules across the cell membrane using a protein to help carry it across. Things that are big, things that are charged, remember they can't get through the membrane without help. 
Um, this doesn't mean, carry transport doesn't mean that you're always going to use energy. Sometimes you will, but not always. Facilitated diffusion is carrier transport, but it doesn't require energy. Um, and carrier transport can even sometimes go uphill or go against the concentration gradient, which I'll explain more of in a minute. So let's work through this. This is facilitated transport, also known as facilitated diffusion. This is the movement of molecules across the cell membrane, still going from high to low, but we're going to use a protein channel to help provide easy access for larger charged molecules to cruise across the membrane. Doesn't require energy, and it goes with the concentration gradient or downhill. Active transport's the opposite. This is the movement of molecules across the membrane using carrier molecules. It does require energy, and it often goes against the gradient. So what does it mean to go against the gradient? Well, I've got a lot of molecules here. I've got very little here. Normal with the gradient means molecules from this hand go here, downhill. Well, active transport, opposite. Molecules from this hand are going to go uphill. That takes work. That takes energy. That's what it means to go against the concentration gradient. All right, last two, endocytosis, exocytosis. So endocytosis is the process of transporting materials into the cell with a vesicle. Um, there's two types, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. And phagocytosis, that's what cells do when they eat. And pinocytosis, that's what cells do when they drink. They engulf um, a matter of liquid into a vesicle and they move that inside of the cell. Both of these require energy, right? Both of them require energy. Now, after all the digesting and drinking has been done, exocytosis will happen. That's the process of transporting materials out of the cell with that same vesicle. Okay, CW Bio, that's your journey through the plasma membrane and some of the types of cell transport that are required in order to maintain homeostasis. Remember, these videos can be found on my YouTube site, and handouts to go with these lectures are always available on my website. We'll continue to explore this and more through lab and the other activities in class. All right, all right guys, I'll see you next time.